You are listening to Catholic Family Podcast. Greetings, fellow travelers through the liturgical year. This is Lisa Davis with another Feast Day Quick Take on the Feast of St. John Marie Vianney, who once said, A priest goes to heaven, or a priest goes to hell, with a thousand people behind. Listen and see which direction today's saint brought his thousand. Known popularly as the Cure de Ars, he was born in the village of Dardilly near Lyon, France, on the 8th of May, 1786. The fourth of the six children of Matthew and Marie Vianney, John Marie's formative years coincided with the tumult and terror of the French Revolution. Heroic Catholic priests risked imprisonment and death to bring the Mass and sacraments illegally to the people of France, employing all manner of stealth. Two nuns, displaced from their order by the terror, provided catechetical instructions for the Vianney children in a private home. St. John received his first communion at the age of 13 in a neighbor's kitchen. These risks, taken by the faithful Catholics of France and the courage of the religious, impressed upon the heart of young John the preciousness of his faith and planted the seeds of a vocation. It wasn't until 1806, however, at the age of 20, that he was able to enter the minor seminary in Ecolier near Lyon, and a commonly known fact of his biography, he was not a natural student and struggled with academics in general, but not a soul doubted his vocation. In order to progress toward the priesthood, though, young John needed to prove more than his holiness. And with the aid of tutors, he managed to pass his courses, even Latin, which was his Achilles heel. But his progress to the priesthood met with an unexpected obstacle, bigger even than his difficulty memorizing declensions. In an unexpected twist, he found himself swept up in the wake of the Napoleonic Wars, caught up in a military draft which did not excuse seminary students, as had always been the norm in France. John had little choice but to obey the summons of the army, though he certainly did not believe in the cause of Napoleon. But in what may have been an act of God, St. John became ill just as his unit of draftees left Lyon, and he was left behind. Then, having recovered, he was sent to Rouen to be included in another draft, but missed the departure of his unit because he had gone into a church to pray. An act of God again? Maybe. Or perhaps young John was a conscientious objector. One could hardly blame him. Having been once again left behind in Lyon, John was put in touch with a young man who had agreed to lead him back to his group. But instead, in sympathy perhaps with those who did not believe seminarians should be conscripted at all, he led John into the mountains of Lefores to the village of Lesnos, where deserters were being hidden. Now, it has not come down to us whether or not St. John was complicit in this subterfuge, but once in Lesnos, he remained for 14 months, taking on the role of schoolmaster for the children of the town. By the following year, 1809, Napoleon's pursuits had moved on to Austria, and amnesty was approved for all French deserters. At last, St. John could return to Ecouilly to resume his studies. But his lack of academic skill slowed his progress once again. Though he was tonsured in 1811, he was moved down from the major seminary in the autumn of 1813 because he couldn't keep up with the rest of the seminarians. He had a couple of advocates, however, who understood the depth of St. John's piety and convinced the vicar general to give him a second chance. By the grace of God, the aid of kind tutoring, along with much hard work and prayer, St. John finally reached the diaconate in June of 1815 and was ordained a priest in August of that same year. His first assignment was as an assistant to his friend and mentor, one of his advocates, Father Bali in Ecouilly. Upon the death of Bali in 1818, St. John was appointed parish priest of Ars, the appointment he would maintain for the rest of his life. This little village not far from Lyon would become the humble platform from which he would eventually become known to the whole world. It is a little known fact that St. John Vianney founded an orphanage for destitute girls called the Providence, which became a model for other such charities throughout France, 
But successful though it was, the curé, much to his sorrow, felt obliged to close the chapter in his own parish due to political conflict amongst benefactors and critics. People being the way people are the world over and throughout the ages, a good work was hampered by pettiness, much to the curé's sorrow. This endeavor, however, was never actually intended to be his life's work, something we can see easily in retrospect. The curé's chief calling was in the direction of souls, a talent the light of which glowed so brightly even in such a quiet country corner that it soon became visible to searching souls worldwide. St. John hadn't been the curé long before people began making the trek to ours from nearby parishes to seek his advice. Then from further parishes, then from the far corners of France, and finally from other countries. By the last 10 years of his life, he spent 16 to 18 hours a day in the confessional. The spiritual director of bishops, priests, religious, men and women from all stations of life. By 1855, when he was 69 years old, pilgrims seeking his counsel numbered 20,000 a year. And what was it that drew all these people to a simple country priest who barely passed his examinations for ordinations? First and foremost, his humility, the light of grace in his wisdom, and his plain speaking underlined by the divine finger through St. John's humility. The curé was all gentleness, but he never hesitated to call a spade a spade. He distinguished himself by his common sense keen insight and supernatural knowledge. He knew when sins were withheld or forgotten in an imperfect confession, and he possessed a gift for communicating his instructions in a way best understood by each individual soul. The miracles of conversions and the sanctification of lives stand as his greatest work. Now I'd like to finish his life story by quoting from the book, The Holiness of the Church in the 19th Century, Saintly Men and Women of Our Times, by Constantine Kempf, Imprimatur John Cardinal Parley, 1915. Quote, Ours proved to be a constant miracle. Men could not say precisely what it was that attracted these vast crowds from near and far. They saw only a poor little church and a poorly clad priest. Yet they stood there close thronged and waited patiently two or three days to confess to him and to listen to his simple catechism, which powerfully stirred their consciences. Many came out of mere curiosity, but on these too fell the rays of grace. They could not resist going in and confessing their sins to the holy priest. To these wonders of grace were added the most astonishing cures of the sick, which he effected through the intercession of St. Philomena and his wise admonitions, which were certainly inspired by divine enlightenment. These labors demanded of him the heaviest personal sacrifice. He could hardly allow himself one or two hours of rest at night. A little after midnight, he hurried to the confessional, there to remain the whole day except during the time of Mass, of the brief instruction, and of his very scanty meal. One cannot understand whence he derived the physical strength for such uninterrupted exertions. Still, not satisfied with all this, he afflicted his body with the severest penances, and it pleased God to send him the most grievous interior trials. His combats with the evil one, which are verified by the best authorities, remind us of what St. Athanasius relates of the hermit Anthony. All that is related of the gifts of grace and the fullness of virtue possessed by the Holy Cure of ours, and of the wonderful cures and conversions wrought by him, is full of consolation. What faith teaches of the power, the beauty, and the grandeur of the soul of the just man was embodied in him. Vianney was to be set against the unbelieving spirit of the age as a visible proof of the truth of Christian teaching. On July 29, 1859, the curé, then 73 years of age, had been as usual for 16 or 17 hours in the confessional, and there his strength suddenly gave way. On the morning of the 4th of August, his soul took its flight to heaven, while Abbe Monin was reciting the prayer of the dying. But his influence was not ended with his death. 
All Christendom rejoiced when Pius X, on January 8, 1905, numbered this ideal pastor of souls among the Beatified. He was canonized on March 31, 1925, by Pope Pius XI, the one and only parish priest to be canonized. Indeed, the miracles and graces did not end when St. John Marie Vianney's life ended. And we have a particular unique proof. St. John Marie Baptiste Vianney is numbered among those saints whom God chooses to manifest his power and demonstrate his approval. Indeed, the miracles and graces did not end when his life ended. And we have a particular unique proof. St. John Marie Baptiste Vianney is numbered among those saints whom God chooses to manifest his power and demonstrate his approval. Humble St. John, who failed in Latin, is one of the few incorruptible saints. From the book, The Incorruptibles, by Joan Carroll Cruz, quote, Completely exhausted by apostolic labors and by the additional penances he inflicted on his thin, sickly body, the saint died peacefully on August 4, 1859, after receiving the final consolations of his religion. Forty-five years later, on June 17, 1904, his body was exhumed because of his impending beatification and was found dried and darkened, but perfectly entire. Only his face, which was still perfectly recognizable, suffered a little from the effects of death. Joan Carroll Cruz then quotes the biography of the Cure de Ars by Abbe Francois Trochu. Quote, the precious remains were wrapped in bands of fine linen and clothed in the following vestments a tunic of white watered silk, a black cassock, a rocher edged with fine lace, and a stole of cloth of gold embroidered with lilies and roses of the same material. A rosary of jasper beads was twined around the darkened fingers, and the face was covered with a wax mask, which reproduces the features of the servant of God. When, on April 2, 1905, the old men of ours, who had known Monsieur Vianney well, were shown the relic as it is seen today by pilgrims, they burst into tears and exclaimed with one voice, Oh, how truly like him! Cruz continues, During the year of his beatification, his perfectly preserved heart was removed and enclosed in a beautiful reliquary, which was placed in a separate building called the Shrine of the Cure's Heart. The magnificent reliquary which contains the body of the saint was donated by priests around the world and is situated above an altar of the basilica which was annexed to the old parish church. Preserved at ours are the living quarters of the saint which have been kept exactly as they were on the day of his death and on whose walls can be seen the pictures which the cure had hung himself. Also kept there are his personal articles, his breviary, the rosary he frequently used, a blood-stained discipline, and the bed which had been set on fire during one of the devil's frequent visitations. End quote. Another legacy of St. John Marie Vianney comes down to us through his devotion to St. Philomena. The cure first learned of the newly rediscovered saint through the miraculous cure of his friend Pauline Jericho, the foundress of the Society of the Propagation of the Faith and the Living Rosary. Through her influence, he received a fraction of the relic of St. Philomena from the shrine in Mugnano, and with great reverence had it enshrined in its own chapel in ours, where it instantly became the site of numerous conversions, cures, and miracles. And St. John Riviani became her greatest champion. It's said that the cure did everything for her, and St. Philomena did everything for him. My children, said St. John Vianney, St. Philomena has great power with God, and she has, moreover, a kind heart. Let us pray to her with confidence. Her virginity and generosity in embracing her heroic martyrdom have rendered her so agreeable to God that he will never refuse her anything that she asks of us. This love of his life provides the perfect preview for St. Philomena's feast day, which is appropriately placed within view of this feast of her greatest champion, falling two days from now on August 11th. Stay tuned in to Catholic Family Podcast. I hope to continue the love of our St. Philomena on Thursday. But before I go, I'd like to share some of the quotes of St. John Marie Vianney, a small taste of his wisdom. 
much to ponder, and a few words. There is nothing so great as the Eucharist. If God had something more precious, he would have given it to us. Do not try to please everybody. Try to please God, the angels, and the saints. They are your public. We put pride into everything, like salt. We like to see that our good works are known. If our virtues are seen, we are pleased. If our faults are perceived, we are sad. I remark that in a great many people. If one says anything to them, it disturbs them, it annoys them. The saints were not like that. They were vexed if their virtues were known and pleased that their imperfections should be seen. Only after the last judgment will Mary get any rest. From now until then, she is much too busy with her children. Humility is like a pair of scales. The lower one side falls, the higher rises the other. Let us humble ourselves like the Blessed Virgin, and we shall be exalted. The virtue of obedience makes the will supple. It inspires the courage with which to fulfill the most difficult tasks. On the way of the cross you see, my children, only the first step is painful. Our greatest cross is the fear of crosses. We have not the courage to carry our cross, and we are very much mistaken. For whatever we do, the cross holds us tight. We cannot escape from it. What then have we to lose? Why not love our crosses and make use of them to take us to heaven? You either belong wholly to the world or wholly to God. The Lord is more anxious to forgive our sins than a woman is to carry her baby out of a burning building. If you invoke the Blessed Virgin when you are tempted, she will come at once to your help, and Satan will leave you. I thought a time would come when people would rout me out of ours with sticks, when the bishop would suspend me, and I should end my days in prison. I see, however, that I am not worthy of such a grace. My little children, your hearts are small, but prayer stretches them and makes them capable of loving God. Through prayer, we receive a foretaste of heaven and something of paradise comes down upon us. Prayer never leaves us without sweetness. It is honey that flows into the soul and makes all things sweet. When we pray properly, sorrows disappear like snow before the sun. Put a good bunch of grapes under the wine press and a delicious juice will come out. Under the wine press of the cross, our soul produces a juice that feeds and strengthens us. When we haven't got any crosses, we are dry. If we carry them with resignation, what happiness, what sweetness we feel. We ought to run after crosses as the miser runs after money. Nothing but crosses will reassure us at the day of judgment. When that day shall come, we shall be happy in our misfortunes, proud of our humiliations, and rich in our sacrifices. The first thing about angels that we ought to imitate is their consciousness of the presence of God. Yes, my dear children, everything is good and precious in God's sight, when we act from the motives of religion and of charity, because Jesus Christ tells us that a glass of water would not go unrewarded. You see, therefore, my children, that although we may be quite poor, we can still easily give alms. It is always springtime in the heart that loves God. The man of impure speech is a man whose lips are but an opening and a supply pipe, which hell uses to vomit its impurities upon the earth. Envy, my children, follows pride. Whoever is envious is proud. See, envy comes to us from hell. The devils, having sinned through pride, sinned also through envy, envying our glory, our happiness. 
Why do we envy the happiness and the goods of others? Because we are proud. We should like to be the sole possessors of talents, riches, of the esteem and love of all the world. We hate our equals because they are our equals, our inferiors from the fear that they may equal us, our superiors because they are above us. The devil writes down our sins, our angels all our merit. Labor that the guardian angel's book may be full and the devil's empty. Private prayer is like straw scattered here and there. If you set it on fire, it makes a lot of little flames. But gather these straws into a bundle and light them, and you get a mighty fire rising like a column into the sky. Public prayer is like that. If people would do for God what they do for the world, what a great number of Christians would go to heaven. All that we do without offering it to God is wasted. See, my children, a person who is in a state of sin is always sad. Whatever he does, he is weary and disgusted with every little thing. While he who is at peace with God is always happy, always joyous. O beautiful life, O beautiful death. Postscript. There are many biographies of St. John Marie Vianney, but one recommended especially by our religious is the Cure de Ars, St. John Marie Baptiste Vianney by Francois Trochu, which was briefly quoted in the Saint cast. This is the definitive story of our saint based on the official records from the process of his beatification and canonization. It's currently in print and published by Tan Books. You can easily find it if you wish. St. John Marie Vianney, patron saint of parish priests, pray for us and pray for all of our priests and seminarians. Amen. <music>